right, friends, we got a balanced data slate today. So we got John from Can You Roll a Crit on the channel, and we chat through the data slate, as well as bundle in a little preview of our stats show. Um, you can find more of our stats shows on the Patreon every week. Um, here's our conversation. Um, today has such, been such a weird day. It's a big one for the game. The well, end of the Green Menace, perhaps? No, I think Felgor and Commanders are still the best factions in the game. Uh, I don't know. I mean, Shane Shane thinks that uh, Higher Tech beats the beats the ever loving snot out of them at this point. I saw it. I seen it. I watched it happen. I think it'll still be. I think so. One of the things that we talked about is for Higher Tech, like on our last show, was basically how the other Technomancer is really good at killing stuff, and now he can just kill stuff and be an aura bubble, which is which is good. I think. Which is definitely. I would have liked. Needed. If they tied his ability, if the two plus reanimation to him, I don't even think they need the two plus. You just play security, and at the end of the game, everyone gets back up, and you blow them up. Yeah. Like, like now losing three guys on turn one because everybody's on engage is part of the strategy, and it still still can work as long as you kill four guys, like three or four guys on the way in. That's fine. So it's like there is a like there's a holistic strategy now that goes along with Technomancer being an aggro piece, and now you have three aggro turn one pieces that will get up over three turns. Like, if you miss three three ups over three turns, like, it sucks, but that's just part of the game. And, like, your sidekick sorcerer is three APL now? Or you can just have the Apprentech be the one that gives the injury bubble, or, like, the res bubble. Because he can just hold on to it, and then you can have the Technomancer going to do other stuff, and the Apprentech does the six-inch res bubble. Well, I do like that we finally had a balanced data slate, which is, is like, it addresses internal balance, not just external yes yes uh i will say rip we got to pour one out for the void dancers all our homies are void dancers. <laughs> <laughs> pour one out for the homies You're supposed to just dance right on into the void and not even come back yeah. i do Yo, think now that yeah, void can, dancers, now you can make frets well within dancing range yeah the whole problem with void dancers has always been that at the end of the tournament bracket they are just hard stuck but they will like their their win rate has never not been like 55 percent basically Yes, I think it was only in the last three months where they just started overperforming more than they normally did. Yeah, and then of course they immediately got a. This is. This, I will say, I do think this is way too much for Void Dancers, personally. <laughs> well, I think they get they... nothing back. They get nothing back in response. They just the Void Dancers for anyone who's listening who doesn't know what's going on. They lost Fly, and now instead of, and they can't traverse for free. So they have to play with terrain rules, and then climbing and dropping is always two inches. It's like yeah, so they can't even drop for free. <laughs> no, they can't even drop for free. So like, void dancer players who are competitive players are on suicide watch, and all the new players <laughs> who are crushing their friends with void dancers are now like, oh, I have to learn how the game works. And they got nothing back. Like I think this would have been a good patch for them if they had given something back in return, because now they they are way less cheesy to play, right? Like you can't do the move shoot move stuff nearly as efficiently as you could have in the past. And now, <laughs> I don't know what you can give them back. Do. Old jest, yeah, give them back something. Like I think this is probably too harsh on Void Dancer. Like I understand the win rate problem, but like guys, they, they didn't need. There, there's no way they're gonna win a tournament now. Uh, to be fair, listeners, if you do win a four or five round tournament with Void Dancers, you are basically the king of the world at this point. Because <laughs> I don't think it's possible. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, they're not even gonna make it to the the top tables now. <laughs> Dude, it's kind of crazy because our local player, he went to Tampa and he played against a bunch of commandos, barely made it through, got to the last round, played Adrian, number one in the world last year. And then, yeah, there's no way. There's no way. And that was before these nerfs. These nerfs basically mean that there's no way he'll ever win that matchup. At least maybe not with old commandos, but I guess that's the one of the talks for the day. We did finally get hopefully the end of the green tide, right? No. <clears throat> what is the, the interesting thing? People be like, oh, Commandos are dead now. You know, they, they can't even do much. There's still 11 activations, which people keep forgetting that there are 11 activations. And even though the bomb squig is effectively useless now, uh, good Commando players were just using it as an extra activation. So you just hide it. And then maybe turning point three and four, it, it charges into someone and kills someone. Or you just deploy it in the open for it, someone to go, I'm going to shoot at it. And it's like, okay, now I shoot back at you. Like... I mean, to be fair, so like for anyone who doesn't know the changes yet, there were three changes to um, there were three changes to commandos. Bomb squig now makes a shooting attack against only people visible to and within two inches of it. 
Uh, within melee. No, no, no it has to be engagement range. range. Yep. Ah, uh, it's got to be. So you can only charge and blow up, which is which is a big change. It still means that you know a good commando player, if they find a line to use it, can still get a big explosion off with the bomb squig. But it's no longer the free uh, move into position, nuke a board that it used to be. Because the explosion is still. Oh no no! The explosion is only engagement range. Yeah. All right, cool. That's good. And then the choppa no longer gives the fourth attack to the ranged operatives. So burn a boy, dock a boy, snipe a boy, picking up a choppa now are at three attacks instead of four. And then the last change is that just a scratch now only works against normal damage, which and is a big one. For so, uh, I think it does nothing. It only hurt, it only is in specific skew matchups because I think it would have been more impactful as CP one plus. So it counts, counts as one. And the next time you use it two. Because the problem is, like, they weren't. Well, they there didn't are have a problem into teams. Can so. angle towards it now, right? Like, if you're playing something with lethal five or rending, like, the chances of you actually dealing with a boy is way higher than it used to be. Sure, it still works against plasma, but, you know, plasma should be. Which is fine. So, like, I, I think this is a good change because it does. For Halfkin players, Halfkin players are so happy at this change. They're like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> we hate commandos. I mean, like on, on in the dark, this also so. nerfs them on in the dark a little bit because you know there's way more there are way more crit shooting attacks floating around on in the dark in comparison yes. to open. Yeah, so I I do think that this ends up touching commandos where they needed to be touched because on in the dark they were a huge problem. On open, they I think they have been rained back a reasonable amount. They've been hovering around like a forty five to sixty percent win rate for the last couple of weeks since me and Jason have been doing our stat show, which we'll be doing at the end of today with John. But you know, I think uh, me and John, our favorite change, and Jason too, because Jason has been living under the yoke of the veteran guard on his poor elites for the last <laughs> two years. How are we feeling about the veteran guard changes? Someone want to read them off? Yeah, so oh, there's it feels so good. Oh, you go on. It's oh. a very, very welcome change. Um, it was like it was a hundred percent. You can't hide from them between the spotter and the demolition v- veteran, which was actually a big part of my like. Why not just go all engage? The spotter, <laughs> unless so the the spotter got the change we all wanted, so it doesn't work against heavy cover. Um, as well as the demolition veteran also doesn't work against heavy cover. It doesn't blow up through walls, and it switched to two inches. And then the third one is the plant mine is once per game. Yeah, Vetcard finally in line with us. <laughs> Honestly, like the crazy thing about. This, these three changes are really these are just how all the other teams have been designed and vet guard have just gotten away with it for the yeah. last two years like everyone else yeah. got these changes forever ago and vet guard was like well they're totally fine why would we need changes when i could just blow you up behind a wall on octarius and then run away so dumb like you, you have that guard players go like, we didn't need this change it's like yeah literally you are you are now playing the game everyone else was two years ago when all these changes were done yeah so I'm I'm personally I'm very happy with this just because I'm tired of veteran guard getting to play by other rules. Like I think if their win rate does drop a lot, then this would be a time when they can try to find uses for some of the operatives that get no play, right? The zealot. Well, I'm su- the I'm surprised bruiser, like the melee operatives didn't go to four attacks. Yeah, exactly. Like they could hopefully if their win rate does drop, you know, this is this is now room to upgrade something else. You know, I think Russia is very happy right now. <laughs> the most I don't know. Uh, yeah, because they've been living under the yoke of uh, Fior out there in Russia, just been slapping people with vet guard for the last year and a half. I don't think their win rate's even going to drop because this stuff like new players weren't abusing this nearly as much. And then their win rate is already kind of tanked because it's such a, a new well, I mean, like a new player friendly team because it's in the starter kit. Like it's a cool, like attractive model set. Well, yeah, it's, I mean, it's like this is a change that literally will only affect the highest level of play, which is why I think it's good. But the problem is you will still have general vet guard players complaining, partly because they didn't realize they could do this, but also because they think their team is fine. Um, oh, we also jumped ahead a little bit because we were kind of, we started at like random spots in the balance data site. One of the big the big changes to the core rules: jump tests removed. Cowards, yeah. honestly, yeah. cowardly. Me, t- me too. I-, I am actually quite disappointed. Like they should have. So the jump tests now just auto pass, which is fine, but there should have been some cost to it. Like I preferred on a one, you take two more wounds. Some people saying like it costs you one wire movement to I jump. I've been fine with them removing the jump test on beta decima. Like beta decima is where the jump test matter. On open, I think it's kind of cute because it like gives you a new spot that maybe yeah. you shouldn't like a new angle. But now it's just like, well, it's just free. You might as well do it just to get they to just a better spot. Up. They just give up. Yeah, I, they, yeah. To me, I was like, ah, uh, I get it on beta decima, but meh. 
as as a player, as one of the players, I think in the in the tournament circuit who jumped the most. You know, I'm like, oh, and I have lost a jump test that cost me a point in tournament play, and I was like, well, you know, it's just how it goes. Sometimes it'd be like that. I would have preferred yeah. you can CP reroll it. I would prefer something. Well, to be fair, it is what it is. Like, I think this is fine. And everyone probably is happy with this as a general population thing. But for me, as someone who's had it, had it bite me in the ass, I was like, you know what? It's kind of fun. Kind of fun to yeah. let it ride or die. As someone who has fate like at least a third of his jump tests, I still don't like it auto passy with no cost because it, it just means you fly now. Like, yeah, I played yeah, a tournament on Sunday where mysteriously they were like oh don't worry right we're playing beta decimal with auto pass jumps because that's what games workshop was going to do and i was like sure whatever we don't know but we would have preferred it and then it's like it happened but also more importantly just it felt like there was no risk i did like three jump tests in a single move and dash and i was just like i just fly now nothing yeah. and then and then the other big changes are strictly for beta decima is that the obscure obscuring from the water is now visibility blocking which means that the phobos are no longer the menace i wonder who came up with that suggestion repeatedly vocally and and then uh you know you know there are play testers on this uh, podcast right now uh shut up no I, like, uh, my, my phone is full of notifications going, and then oh, uh, these changes hiding, familiar to. hiding and all the four deploys on strictly beta decima are now only within wholly within four inches which i think is a pretty pretty nice change well, so the big change is I need to check if the visibility thing, I think it applies when you're shooting from a gantry and it crosses the footprint of a gantry as well, but I need to double check that. I know it applies over the ocean, so the ocean now blocks visibility, but I need to check if it blocks visibility from shooting through the gantry down onto the kill zone floor. Uh, those are still obscured. I think I think going underneath gantries is obscured. Unless it, oh, oh, because re restricted line of sight maybe is the, yeah, the wording. Was, was yes. all of that Remember. falling under there? Okay, let's see. Hold on. I'm going to look it up right now. Uh, restricted line of sight. Ah, yes, it is. Okay. All right. So, yes. If you shoot under a gantry, it is now visibility blocked. Yeah. So all of that obscured special rules is visibility blocked. Yeah. I don't, this is, that's definitely one of the weirder ways to put this change into the game it is re in restricted line of sight. It just says the target operative is not visible. But if you go look at the actual download for uh, beta decima, <laughs> restricted line of sight is three blocks of text. It's like, it's, it's, it's the whole thing with into the dark. Oh, you can't forward deploy. We're just going to remove the last sentence from everything that forward deploys. What's the worst that could happen? So this probably won't last. Because it doesn't. They'll probably. I mean, makes, I. I think we understand what this is trying to do. So yeah. easier than the forward deploy one. The forward deploy one was pretty bad. The suggestion just got lost in translation. I feel. Yeah. All but right. The forward cool, deploy so. change thing is good. Yeah. Uh, I think it just means Wormblade are now less oppressive. Necrons are just now moving the the same. Well, I mean, they still start four inches forward, but they actually. I think they actually suffer a big nerf now on Beta Decima. Yeah. I mean, Beta Decima. I think this at least goes a long way to making it so that the teams that are good on beta decima no longer feel like they get to play a whole separate game compared to everyone else. Because like Phobos, Commandos, and Void Dancers all basically got to ultra cheat on beta decima. And I think when Ace was on here, he mentioned how teams that are good on beta decima feel like against teams that are normal on beta decima is just not fun. Yeah. And this does help narrow that gap quite a bit, I think. Well, it's like I played with Pathfinders after like all, over 18 months on Beta Decima and I only lost oh, one game by one point. They're disgusting. Point. They're disgusting on Beta Decima. <laughs> so, so a Hyrotech Nano mind me turning point one and I killed four of his operatives turning yeah. point one in a turn. You're like, fine, you, you've Nano mind me. It's like, well, there's nowhere to hide and nowhere to go. So everyone's just going <laughs> to die instead and I'll be obscured. Yeah, yeah it's like, but I'm obscured. It's like, yeah, but you have five marker lights now. So you're just dead. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, so. Void dancers we talked about. Wormblade finally it got the uh, the sanity check that they needed because before I think everyone was trying to argue whether or not they all basically always had cult ambush or never had cult ambush, yeah. and we're basically <laughs> at the position where it's more likely than not that you won't have cult ambush, which I think is well, at least not from the secondary rule. You get it from flipping from conceal to engage, but now if you're visible to anyone, then you don't get it, which I think is the same way that everyone probably expected it to be played yes <laughs> like i think it's now definitely works with coming out of hiding yes. because you don't start your activation on the board uh but they're probably one of the best kill teams in the game right now i would say 
they did reasonably well. Jason, you saw them at a, you saw J- JD, you know, the America's best Wormblade player r- cruising around in Adepticon in his home haunt. How did he do? And do you think, you know, how, how do, how do you think Wormblade are after seeing them in action a little bit? Yeah, I mean, the, the change, uh, uh, I didn't even check, was it ruled that way at Adepticon? I think it probably was. Um, so ultimately, it's not that big of a change for them there. Um, JD did really well. I didn't personally play against him. Um, but it seemed like he was having having the time of his life out there. Yeah, he made it to the end to the top eight pod, I think. He did, yeah. He did, yeah. So he made it to the final pod. He did lose two of his games in the top pod, but I do think, it, yeah, Wormblade, very good right now. The change to have the Talon be useful and, you know, getting more rerolls definitely has helped him quite a bit. Yeah, and then, like, the changes to Vet Guard and Commandos, like, Wormblade could have ha- well, done a way better job hanging that top eight pod after those changes. Yeah. Uh, next up, we've got our Thousand Suns, All Is Dust, the Warp Coven, getting one small nerf and three pretty large buffs, I think. Yeah, I do like how they're completely not like they're completely different from the kill team that was released when they were a white dwarf team like yeah their their list of changes has an entire page dedicated to it. <laughs> there's a whole extra page that's just the warp coven yeah, which just, honestly makes like, sense because they're always the most complicated team yeah annoyingly I mean, they it. still are i'd say <clears throat> and Interestingly enough, you know, before we get into the changes, Warp Coven on our week to week stat show, they've been doing reasonably well the last couple of weeks. So it's not like I don't even think like this. This should help them quite a bit. And they've been getting slowly changed more and more. And now this is a I think these are some big changes, basically. And yeah. now basically everyone can freely double fight and double shoot. That's the first bullet point is exalted to start. Is just this is just on just like a uh, Vanguard, except Vanguard costs you one CP. Wait, it does it apply to shooting uh, combat as well? I thought it was just shooting. Exalted Astartes, zero CP, and at, add the following. In addition, at the end of turning point, rubrics, if it did not fight, it can perform two shoots. If it's a gunner, it costs an additional AP. So all your rubrics now double shoot, <laughs> and the gunner double shoots for three APL. All of your sorcerers double fight, double shoot, as long as your shoots are different profiles. So warp coven just just even if it was just that change i think that would already be a ton but that's not even yeah. the only change they got well I, I i only have to say rip for the flamer because the flamer basically can't double shoot because it can but it's never going to be in range to double shoot so it's, it, it's just encouraging you to always take the soul reaper cannon which you should be anyway but like they're just literally like look just just always take the soul reaper cannon i think the problem for taking the gunner is it's just not as efficient as a soul reaper cannon so it's always been kind of hard to justify anyways uh, the yes. rubric command ability is now a nine inch range ability. So you basically all of your if you go three and three, three sorcerers, three rubrics, I suspect you basically just fully play as an 18 activation, like 18 APL team, because it's pretty hard to be out of nine inches unless all your sorcerers are dead. It's a pretty big change. And then Zangor has got a buff. They are nine wounds instead of eight, which means that now they tango with all the eight wound operatives very nicely. Psychic powers. Ephemeral instability now is one inch instead of two inches, which does mean that at least you can charge them a little bit better. But considering that the rubrics in the last patch went up to four attacks with the gargoyle bayonets, charging a rubric is not always the best idea anymore because four attacks on threes, four, four is a real profile. Yeah. Yep. And then there was also that ability that your psychic powers, instead of uh, expiring at the end of the turning point, now expire at the start of your next activation, which is actually kind of a stealth buff to ephemeral instability as now it lasts longer, like you can cast it and you don't you don't have to immediately activate that sorcerer first to maintain it. Yeah. And then all of the curses and buffs now last an extra turn. You know, Destiny can curse someone so that you get full Relentless against them. And then I think there's also a defensive one where you get full Relentless on defense, right? Yeah. I, I, I was trying to think, they don't have any other powers outside of that, do they? Mm, those are the three. I think every every skew got one uh one buff that was an ephemeral instability was and now ephemeral instability is now until that sorcerer activates again the relentless is until you activate again and reroll defenses until you get activated again so i think those are actually those are huge changes and there's still one more arcane robes is now once a turning point so you can now reduce crit to normal one time to- once a turn per arcane robe per per uh 
per sorcerer. So all three sorcerers hold the robes. They go from 13 wound operatives that act as 13 wound operatives, probably like 15 wound operatives almost. Yeah. And you have a heel. So like Warp Coven, I, they sound like they kind of slap. I might have to bust mine out of uh, storage. So mine are unpainted. But the thing mine is, have I been think painted. <laughs> The big change here is the Zangor is going up to nine wounds. Uh, sorry, Pekanon just firing twice. And then I don't even know if I would use. Gonna... I don't even know if I, I care about the Zangors right now. I, I, well, nine wounds is actually quite important, but it's like the other thing is, even though ephemeral instability is worse, um, it's now effectively always on and you don't have to recast it at the start of every turning point. But you I think the big problem. Yeah, I think the big problem the kill team will have is that their tack ops suck. So they're just literally living off of pure recon. No, I think you just play security and just play for the end of the game now. Just blow them up. Just but they have them. no good faction tack ops. They have no good faction they tack do. ops. They, you're just playing pure... You're just playing with pure, the pure decks. But I'm I mean, surprised they didn't change their faction tack ops. They just swap a tack op. I, <clears throat> yeah, one wonders where faction tack ops are going to be over well, yeah, time because it, 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 it's, it's like the, their teams with faction tack ups that still just are trash like legionary have no faction tack ups and have had no faction tack ups for the entire game well that's why uh when we get a next edition i'm hoping they remove faction tack ups but you can see here my only annoyance with this warp coven changes they've changed some i'd say almost half of the abilities to last until they next activate but they've left the other half alone and my only thing is this probably is going to be a change going into the new edition where abilities always work until someone next activates. But you've done it for half of the kill teams. Why not just do it for the other half? You know, you've got like uh, some of the abilities for Halfkin, even like, you know, the Star Strider Lectu Maester. Technically, why, why don't you just make it a synergistic change and then is it just picking and choosing kill teams to do it on? Yeah, that could just be like a universal rule that's just like any ability that would end at the end of the turning point switches to end at their next activation. Yeah, can you imagine track target? Just like, oh yeah, oh yeah, I don't care about the end of the turning point. That would be sick, actually. That would be amazing. Uh, so yeah, War Coven stocks on the rise. You know, we've been tracking them week to week on our stat show. They did pretty well last week. They did well this week, which we haven't covered yet. We'll cover that at the end. And um, the, these buffs are huge buffs. And then uh, we're we're down to Crute. Me and John's uh, past love. <laughs> Poor Crute. They. This is like. It's it's nice, right? They went with some they've of the a, stuff. They've had a series of tons and tons of nice changes, but it hasn't really quite put them over the edge of being like broken. But. Now, you know, the melee is better on the team because now your kill broker and your stalker and your hounds all are five act five attack operatives when you do cutthroats, which does mean that you can reliably at least mulch the seven wound operatives. Because I think that was actually one of the more annoying things for far stalkers. Like you against elites, you're not gonna kill them anyways. You just play point team and you run around them and you poach your objectives. But when you go to the vet guard, you're like, ah, my single crude dude, four attacks on threes, three, four against your single vet guard, three attacks on fours, two, three. I can probably kill you with cutthroats on and it never happens. It just doesn't. Yeah, it's like, I think the only buff we were kind of missing is a buff to the pistolier. So the pistolier is unchanged. Or every, like, I assumed they would let him move and double shoot because I think like it's just a free four lethal five up gun firing twice was because at the moment you can only dash and double shoot or stand still and double shoot and it's i i just feel like that people are like oh the leader buff is great it's like why would i want my leader in combat he is going to die and then i lose like so all the abilities that chain off of him so it's great he can go up to five attacks for five the stalker goes up to five attacks i think the stalker going up to five attacks is a yes. big one because he's yes. the concealed you ignore your barricade you yeah. dash six and you charge six inches stab someone with a double attack they instantly die because now you have five attacks with yep. balanced and rending so the moment you get a crit you're doing eight damage without your opponent reacting and that actually is a big change for them because that one means that now you can threaten a lot of the a lot of the opposing teams which is nice yeah, it's just I would have liked them generally to go to free five in combat or even at worst tie it to the plus one attack ploy because it's just the biggest problem crew have is eight wound teams at the moment and elites, yeah. but at least less so it's the eight wound teams because they actually can't reliably kill an eight wound or greater operative in combat. 
Yeah. I actually think that it's funny that people are like, oh, the Hound going to GA1 is good. I'm like, sometimes no. it was nice. Yeah, sometimes no. it was nice to go to GA2. It would have been nice for the Warriors to go to GA1. I think, I think the Warriors the... should have been GA1. The big problem with the Hounds going to GA1 uh, is while you go to 12 activations, the biggest thing you could do with crew is set up multi-charges turning point two. So for example, you would have one Hound pick up and one Hound set defensively. So then you can go like move away and charge or just double charge. Because the issue is, like, especially in the Horde, you would charge a Crute Hound, would call the kill into two guys, kill one, and then the other Hound either charges that charged operative or another two operative and just like immediately kills two and ties up two. This time, you can only do it one at a time and it leaves your opponent more time, more time to react considering your Hound is oddly one of your best melee operatives because it has inbuilt rending. So I you think it's five actually... attacks on cutthroats, which was a big yeah. part of it, it being good. I think I think it's more of a side grade, and I would say personally more of a nerf than a buff. It's a weird. It's generally a side grade, but I don't think it's an actual buff. I actually think yeah. it's more of a nerf than a buff. Crude, crude are definitely like a series of tiny changes here and there that I think has improved the team, but the team still is like very very high skill for it being. You know, they're never. I I don't think that like even if they change them a bunch like this, it's good, but it's not going to be enough to push them to top tables, which is fine. I think yeah. it, it doesn't. They don't need to be you know the eight the eight zero tournament winner as long as you can have a pretty good tournament run and still have a chance and fight through most of your games. And I think that's kind of what this feels like. I don't know how you yeah. feel, Jason. Looking because did you play, have you played against Crude anytime recently? Um, it's been a while. Um, but I mean, also we haven't even mentioned the trackers' abilities were switched to you can't perform it uh, while within engagement range instead of within six. And that's true. That, yeah. That's a pretty big change, just because it's really, really easy for people to be within six, especially if you if like you push up into the middle and like people are dying, you push more people up into the middle. You're contesting points, um, and then you're gonna lose that ability quickly. And now that instead it is like unless people are in engagement, you can't use your ability. You're gonna get a lot more usage out of um, marked for the hunt and from the eye above. True. Yeah. Getting an APL and being able to track people definitely is a big buff for them because now the tracker maybe you can actually use as a proactive piece just as like an extra melee guy that can actually go do stuff. Because before you had there was a lot of tension on keeping him all the way in the back line to use the abilities and being too close with, and losing the ability to pass APL and stuff. Yeah, that was just weird. I only realized literally that two months ago where, where I was speaking to Ryan because we were talking about Kroot because uh, he was like, I was like, because we both played crew a lot, and then he was like, "Oh, you know the comms doesn't work if someone walks within six. I was like, "What are you talking about? You liar!" I was like, "Why? The bird is so scared, but the bird is braver now." But like, yeah, I mean, yeah. like it's it's nice stuff. I think the Farstalker have been on the lower end of the win rate for the last you know month that me and Jason have been looking at them, but. I do think that they are one of those teams where I would be very surprised if they if they ever started hitting like 60 percent win rate. It's probably because the team is way, way over tuned. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Uh, you know, and then we're on to higher tech circle. You know, Shane out here on our podcast, pulling the ladder up from underneath him after winning Adepticon. He said <laughs> Temporal Nanomine is how I won Adepticon. And he just just got it nerfed. It's gone now. It's not gone. It's not gone. It's not it's not that bad. <laughs> It's like I'm taking my ball home now and my free flight. <laughs> yeah, he wins. He wins a you know wins a tournament and he's like you know what they should nerf this and then they did. Uh, yeah, so counter counter temporal nanomine instead of a six inch bubble is now a three inch bubble, which is much more manageable, way easier to dodge, but still annoying if you have to get onto one exact point. It can no longer lock you in your deployment, but it can lock you to get onto a point, which I think is probably where it should be. <laughs> And it doesn't stop dashes now. Yes. And it can't slow people down slower than four inches, which is huge. Yeah, Whereas so like it, elite, it was a pretty big nerf. Yeah, elite players like, oh my gosh, I can move again. It's amazing. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> and it's no longer a 12-inch bubble, which was just ridiculous. Like, do you realize people, like, I was trying to sell it to Hyrotech players because they get very upset every time I mention it. It's like, do you realize how big a 12-inch bubble is? Just, just measure it and put it on a kill team board. You you lock off almost a quarter of the board with it. It's ridiculous. And that's like the entire quarter of the board that the enemy player is trying to like move within. Yeah, yeah on uh, diagonal boards, it's like, oh, you just can't leave at all. <laughs> yeah, it's like, nope, no, you, you can't play this game. You just so don't like, play. I get a turning point one and you do not. Uh, good luck coming back from that. Well, it's even worse because it's there until the <laughs> until the cryptic next activates. So it's just like it's just there for two turns, but effectively because you could just wait. 
But the worst thing was on Beta Decimal, you can just place it in the ocean, which is just ridiculous. So oh, you yeah. place it in the ocean, even though, like, generally, this is the one, uh, one thing I realized at the Beta Decimal tournament, you probably shouldn't be allowed to place barricades and tokens in the ocean. Um, but then placing it all of a sudden was just like, oh, I don't even need to get close to your drop zone. Uh, six inches in the ocean. Yeah, I don't know how it's floating. And uh, now you just can't move. Yeah, I think I had that happen with Kroot because the Kroot bird can fly over the ocean also. And I was like, <laughs> oh my God, this is so annoying. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you can place tokens in the ocean. There's not a lot of tokens that could do it, but, you know, Nuncio Quilla, the Kroot bird, oh, you know, <laughs> a handful of things that can float over the waves and destroy you. So so I think this change is a good one. And in in response to the Techno or the Chronomancer getting nerfed, uh, they gave two buffs to the Technomancer and the Psychomancer and the Apprentech. And reanimation. And reanimation. Oh my god, and reanimation. It was like ultimately Hyrotech ultimately got like a giant buff. And like the nanomine was just the star of the show and it kind of like toned down, but is like definitely not gone. Yeah. And uh, oh yeah, reanimation protocols on a two instead of a three. The chance of you missing three in a row is basically zero now, but it's not zero. But it, it should feel like zero in most games. I, I am disappointed. Basically, um, Hyrule Tech Circle went from the most RNG faction on Beta Decima to now the least. Well, it's still an RNG faction, but not as bad. Because remember, it's like the cursed thing where they fail their reanimation rolls and they fail their jump test. And like, they just they just hate life. You know, they fail all their attacks, all their defense rolls. Now there's less comedy, but they are more reliable. So they're way more reliable. And like security higher tech has never been better because <laughs> basically if you miss one reanimation, you're almost guaranteed to get it. The following yeah. turn, like making multiple ones in a row for a single operative, like should be very, very rare. Um, and in response, the Technomancer is now a six inch bubble of an extra reanimation that he does not need to activate. If you have the ability, it just is on. Yeah, no, it's it's. It's just, I would have liked it for free, but it's minus one APL if you trigger it. So yeah. at least I mean, it's to be fair, you can still suck the AP out of other people. So like the Technomancer can always at least work as like a three APL operative if necessary. And he flies like everyone else. So I do think that the Technomancer now is a real uh, operative because when Shane was on here, he was talking about how the Technomancer's gun is like one of the best guns in the team. Yes. Yes. Because it's six uh, it's on three, no, six three, four. Even, yeah. Uh, like three, yeah, it's, four, it's, AP two or something. So it's just like it's uh, AP one. Oh, yeah. It's a soul yeah. reaper cannon. It just flies around cannon. with a soul reaper cannon. But you can get rerolls with it through the apprentice. So it's like very easy, very trivial for it to just do. Like, oh yeah, I just hit you five times with AP yeah. one. Like you, you're dead. <laughs> and I like that they did slightly buff <laughs> the psychomancer as well. So when the psychomancer yeah. injures someone, basically on a fifty percent chance or greater, they're minus one APL as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. And now the Apprentic is a three APL operative. I think that was literally the thing that Shane was asking for as a buff if counter temporal nanomine gets nerfed. So Well, it's weird because even even when I was playing it, I keep I keep assuming like that the Apprentic should have been three APL. I was like, oh it's three APL. And then I was like, oh no, he's only two. So yeah. it just makes him more useful. So the the Hyrotech meta that has been foretold, I think, is here, you know. Even though Counter Temporal Nanomine has been nerfed, I don't think it has been nerfed enough where it's not usable. And as Shane was saying, the Chrononometron is still the best ability that the team has. You know, extra three inches of movement, four, five up, five up, feel no pain. I think the big problem is now this team used to shut down every team, but now it only shuts down melee teams because the issue is shooting teams can now just move and dash into their face and shoot them. Whereas before, they just couldn't do that. Like you would just get way too close, as in the Hyrotech, and then you couldn't get back to retaliate. So yeah. I think it it's brought them down a little bit, but they're still really good. But it's nice yeah. that the internal balance has been addressed. I think they're in a good place now. I suspect so... that there's probably like a couple more changes that Techno and Psychomancer could get, but we'll see. I think like we'll go from here and see if the win rates change in massive numbers. I do think that Psychomancer and Technomancer at least have their specific thing that looks good now. Yeah. To be fair, if you're perma-injuring someone with a Psychomancer, do you really need to also give them minus one APL, or would you rather give minus one APL to someone else? Or they make his injury thing a blast, like, you know, the, the <laughs> cursed, you place a token within six, hit everyone. Yeah, but I will say, mind. you know, the the necro the technomancer's ability, you can now give it to the apprentic, and the apprentic can run around with a twelve inch bubble of res rolls while your technomancer goes over and just like laser beams people. Yeah, yeah. 
and while the apprentice sits in the back and covers for the technomancer so like that is that seems very real to me and then they overwatch for each other and it's so annoying yeah it's so annoying yeah um Hearthkin salvagers, John, I'll let you take this one as the short king in the crew. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> the locator, he now. So annoyingly, he still doesn't work against Hyrotech or Wormblade somehow. Yep. But, but he now does stop. He doesn't just stop specific forward deploys. He stops all movement until the start of the first turning point. Like the start of the first uh, firefight phase, which is so good. Like you get no into the breach, no shush, no drawn to the hum, no like uh, plunderers. You get run well, up plunderers. You know, yeah, plunderers from um, corsairs. You get none of that stuff. He just goes like, "You're all slow, just like us." And now he could also grant ignore obscuring, which was just sure. Why not? I'll take that. Cool. Just like yeah. He's like we talk he's about all- the. We talk about the dozer. <laughs> Oh yeah, and the dozer basically he gets a free like Dragon Ball Z teleport if he uppercuts you. Uh so if Nux Smash, like if he does it this time, he now gets a free charge, even if he already charged or dashed. So basically you can charge knock uh knock smash, then follow up charge to still be charge blocking them, locked in combat. Or you can like fight, I don't know, fight, charge, do it again. It's just nice mobility, because there were times where you would like to uh knock smash but also stay in combat so you're in this weird like do i stay on the point safe in combat or do i punch him off but then just lose this operative so you just get some more utility with the dozer i would have liked him to have a better movement value because he has robotic legs so he could actually be a better melee operative but there's just some nice utility there's also the the kind of like stealth buff within there that it's easier to set up a multi charge if that's something you want to do. You just like punch someone into range yeah. of someone else and then charge into both of them. Yeah, it helps a lot with like the vet guard matchup, but it's just a nice tech use in ge- in general because I didn't think they were going to buff Halfkin because they're like borderline. So this is just a I still would have liked the leader's plasma pistol to be AP two, but this is just like good changes. So I think this is the best we can get the locator as. But he basically is like, I think you would always take him against Vetguard now, just because he gives you the shooting edge and stops there into the breach. Because like they now, if they don't use it turning point one, it's basically gone unless they just stay in their drop zone for some reason. So he's just super, he's more than just a tech piece now. He's like an efficient tech piece that also, if you're playing on a heavy board, he just makes you shoot. Because now you have the high las rotary with the Obscurian, and then he just gives, I don't know, plasma beamer, rail rifle, something else, ignore Obscurian. It's a really powerful. Yeah, I mean, Hearthkin definitely on the way up shooting teams. I guess this is kind of the balance that melee teams have gotten very good over the last year or so, so they're like slowly pushing the shooting teams back up a little bit. <laughs> kind of. I mean, this team now just dismantles commandos. So it's just, it's just kind of like commandos die against this kill team. Just to scratch what you've got three grudge tro- three grudge tokens, and I've got an AP one weapon. You're dead. You're dead. Yeah, I think the dozer also kind of extends his threat range out nicely. So you have like two pieces that have actual like threat ranges. You know, between the jump pack and the dozer, because the dozer can now like if he can get the first charge, he can like push the dude and then show up an extra three inches forward. So he kind of has like a ten inch charge. If you yeah. like, yeah. So you can kind of think of it as a ten inch charge range for his final positioning, which can definitely set up stuff nicely for a later turn so if he has the apl maybe you push a dude into another spot charge those two new people kill one of them and now you're set up for the next turn which is is pretty good like you can make it even more hilarious on beta decimal if the platforms are close enough so he just like uppercuts and then backflips onto a single platform by just bullying people around so yeah it's just it's just funny bad it's too bad we can't sparta kick people with a dozer i know i know yeah just Just, punch them off the platform into the water yeah, <laughs> but you have, if you do, you have to follow them in. So you're pushing them and taking them out. <laughs> if only there was a way to use the water, that would be cool, right? Oh god, yeah. But then we'd get some broken team that like is water based that for some reason will just destroy this specific board type. Box three is just like Seraphon in the 40k or Seraphon swimmers. I don't know that much about AOS. Technically, Tau Tau are aquatic creatures. There's oh, a quiet. So we've got an yeah, aquatic Tau yeah, kill I don't, I don't team. Get- I don't get how Tao ended up as fish. I don't. I don't know what happened. Water cars. They've got the water cars. They've always had the water car, <laughs> but they have hooves. Their, their the ships are literally like their ships and vehicles are literally called fish. 
That's the imperial <laughs> propaganda. That's not, that's not the Tau. They don't call them Mantas. Yeah, they call them Montas. <laughs> All right, and then on to the big bad villain of the last of 2024, Felgor Ravagers. Getting a I'm tiny really nerf. I don't know if this is tiny. I do think that these are pretty sizable nerfs. Um, so we've got four layers of nerfs. You know, Jason is the resident Felgor get destroyed, get destroyed by Felgor player. How how are we feeling about this uh, these changes? Um, you know, the war paint to two equipment was very predictable. I think everyone wanted that. Everyone saw it coming. It seemed completely sensible. Um, the death knell war gong has no ability when he's frenzied is a big change because like otherwise you could just like put a blast into the death knell and then frenzy a bunch of people, including the death knell. And then you can't shoot them to death because he's just like standing there frenzied and they're just invincible. So, uh, that's a pretty big deal. Um, but also, I feel like it fixes something that was just completely broken. Um, the Gnarl Scar, also the uncompromising attack where he used to have just a crack grenade in his fist and then just punch you with an explosive metal hand. Uh, now now he has to use his auto pistol for that attack, which I think is a nice touch because um, it was a little cheesy. Plus, now you can like explore some other options with putting the crack grenade on someone else, um, like the interview with Janice last week, Janice was talking about giving the crack grenade to the Vandal, which I think is a nice touch because the Vandal otherwise doesn't have any shooting attacks. Um, and then the Iron Horn call the attack that is switched instead of just like unlimited range line of sight, it is now within six inches, which like the, the small stint that I did playing Felgor, I feel like pretty often I had him positioned within six anyways. Um, just cause but it, it does mean on the, like the big boards, you do actually have to consciously think about where your, your leader's going to go outside of like, Oh, you could just see everybody. It's fine. Well, we'll whatever, whatever my opponent does, yeah. we'll fix it. We'll fix it in post basically. So yep. I do think that it's nice that now that final positioning does matter. And you can actually, maybe you can actually shoot out corners now and actually make it matter. Yeah. <clears throat> well, some my big problems are like, they did a gentle nerf here, like compared to vet God. Okay. Vet God was overdue. Harlequins just like backhanded out of out of compared to play, right? Felgor Ravagers, a kill team that was at 65% before they got buffed and then ended the quarter on 65%, almost like won all the major tournaments that have been played, and they just did a slight nerf. Like the Iron Horse ability should just be once per game. The six inch range, while it does reduce their range of play, is still too powerful to be used every turn. The Nalskar, while he can't use the Crack Grenade, which is great, they probably should have just locked out the Crack Grenade from him because he can still start an engaged turning point one, you give him an APL, he moves, dashes, Crack Grenades, then switch back to Conceal for free. War Paint, there's like, I, I know Jimmy, um, Jelly Kelly, uh, you know, Jelly Jimmy, uh, Jelly Kelly, he, he, he doesn't even play with War Paint and he was topping events. And then the Death Nail, while it's great, it doesn't work while Frenzy, why wasn't this just a general? All the Frenzied operatives should lose all their abilities. So my, my issue is, Frenzy is still too good. They have only had slight changes. I still think they're the best kill team in the meta at the moment. Like, they're worse on Beta Decima-ish, but with the new Beta Decima rules, they're harder to be shot at. It's just, it it really felt, it's just really bizarre. I don't want, understand why they were so light with Felgor when they're clearly a big problem faction. Like, it, it wasn't even just like, oh dear, maybe they'll be fine. Unless Games Workshop is assuming everyone is just going to play on Beta Decima only now. Like... We didn't see this with Pathfinders, you know. Where, where, where was the going like light-handed with Pathfinders? What is this? Just goat. It's just like goat favoritism. Yeah, I mean, I think Felgor definitely. This is definitely a nerf. We'll see if it matters enough because they definitely have had a crazy, crazy high play rate and a crazy, crazy high win rate. I think they're like five percent of the meta flat over the last month, and they've been. 55 plus every week for win rates going all the way up to, I think to like 70 something percent in the last month that me and Jason have been doing, you know, our regular stats check in. And there are enough ways to play them where, you know, maybe this won't affect someone like Jimmy Kelly on the West Coast. Uh, I kind of do wish like, yeah, you know, the death knell. I, I agree. They probably could eat another nerf. We'll see. I mean, it might just be they're in a. Geller Pock situation where they get nerfed over like three different play periods just because they're too good. Well, it's, it's, it's just, I like to think my uh, why melee teams were bad video is just right. Like, they just like, they can only nerf 
a melee team fully a year after they've been released. There's some like internal rule. It's just like just weird. I don't understand because even it's like you can mirror with commandos. It's just like interesting how they've nerfed them for the general play, but not top level. But then you look at Vet Guard. They've nerfed them for the top level. Harlequins, everyone was just kind of complaining about them, but they went too far. You know, they were like, somehow the list of buffs just disappeared <laughs> and only the nerfs stuck, right? And it's, it's just weird. There's like, there's, it doesn't even infect the eternal internal balance that much. It's just a weird change. It's like, it, it's just like they've been, it's just, I don't understand why they've been so so cautious yeah. With the team that I, is I do so think that, like, statistically proven to be bad. From maybe maybe if I were to hold water for the development cycle, melee teams are very, very binary. So if they don't work, they just aren't playable at all because they don't get to interact with the game outside of just melee. So they probably go a little bit slower on them just because they're worried about them. Commandos, I think, was probably not acceptable just because they got to do everything for so long. Not, like uh, nearly a year they dominated the game. And, yeah, and like, yeah, yeah. my issue is we're just going to see the same thing with Felgor. So we're going to have to wait another three months so they'll have like a dominance for nearly a year of the game. Uh, you know, command point Shane, he's out here saying uh, I, he thinks that the Felgor matchup is one of the better matchups for higher tech because they kill you, it they is. die from Frenzy, and then you get back up and you blow up the next one. So I think the problem with Felgor is outside of higher tech, they mess up so many other teams yeah, just because of Frenzy. And it's like, it's really weird they won't address the Frenzy issue. Because it's like, well, well, Hyrotech just mess up these guys. It's like, I, I play Star Striders. I can't play Star Striders while Felgor in this state because literally I have my Assassin and then my leader, but my leader doesn't get her reroll against friendly operatives because they don't have wounds. They're just, <laughs> just there. Uh, so I have to try and shoot them, but then it's like you kind of have to go suiciding after the, the death knell. But it's even just other shooting. Like Vetguard really struggled because it's just they have no melee. And there's a lot of teams who don't have adequate melee which just can't deal with this kill team. And it's just really weird that Games Workshop think that's fine. Honestly, I feel like with the Frenzy, instead of having to deal critical damage to a Frenzied Goat to kill it, if you just deal one more hit of any kind of damage, like, yeah. it still is just, like, totally insane that you fully kill this model and it sticks around, and you have to spend, like, a whole nother activation to kill one more goat. And that's still, like, insane. And it's still very strong, um, and as long as it can still hold objectives, it still matters. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I'm shocked they didn't make them zero OPA one frenzied. It's just, fair, it's, John, the Vekar do have a tech, a single tech piece against the goats and it's, I, I know. Zealot. he opens yeah. the book, reads from the uplifting primer and tells his friends to get lethal five up. It's just, uh, it's just such a weird kill team. Like, especially when you compare it to all the other changes, it was just, they were like, look, finally, I'm sorry, guys, we have to destroy Harlequins. Uh, it, to balance like the cursed monkey's paw we've destroyed harlequins they are not allowed to place at tournaments we'll leave we'll make felgor just a little bit worse <laughs> uh meanwhile the uh, last of the melee, melee hordes is King's oh. Cult, and they got the teeniest tiniest little boop on the nose i think this is enough to like stop this yeah. kill team being a problem i forgot wing so they lost the first bullet point of winged so yep. i did i forgot they ignored all movement penalties i was just like oh gosh they could do that. Uh, they still, like, you know, ignore the first reverse triple climb of white. Uh, but now they have one less devotee, which does actually bring them down to th a 10 activations 14, team. 14.1? 14 operatives. They were a 10 activation team that generally played at around 12 activation. No, turning point one, they were 11. Yeah, they were 11. Then now they are 10. Just keep standing. Yeah. But now they're 10, so... I personally, I would have liked two devotees going, but I'm happy with this. I can live with one devotee I can, going. I can live with this being where they start, and then we'll see where Chaos Cult is. Because Chaos Cult, for as good as they are, are not a high play rate team. There's like literally like six players that want to play Chaos Cults. Yeah, because they all over moved the to last like, month. They yeah, but like over everyone. the last month of like watching the stats, it's like you know Hava is out there in Spain slapping people around with his many many torments. But like that's basically it. Like there's just not a lot of Chaos Cult players. I think this is fine where this kill team is, and if they get never get touched again, I think uh, the issue this kill team is going to have now is they're going to be harder to play for the main best way to play them, which is just to sit back and then engage turning point three and four, like just overwhelm the opponent. Because now starting with one less devotee is huge, and you can't really do that because now if you burn for your two torments and stuff, you're only going to have like what one, one or two devotees left at the end of turning point three, maybe turning point four. 
which means you just don't have enough bodies to actually claim points. So I think it's good. It's good. And the more we see death of melee teams, I'm happy because they're all broken. So. That's because we all, me and you are also shooty players. I guess Jason also likes shooting people. Oh, no, I love combat. Like for me, Gene Stealers, best designed melee team they've ever <laughs> done, right? Even current Galapox are in a good place, right? It's just, yeah, just current annoying. Galapox are good. It's yeah. it's good, yeah. I think this overall, you know, broad thoughts. I really think that this data slate is a good one. It fixes a lot of stuff. I do kind of wish it came, you know, three months ago instead of now. Yes. But yes. I'm happy enough with where things are at, and I am kind of excited to play again. Like I don't know if I'm going to have a ton of time, but I am pretty excited to play. Yeah, it's. Uh, I still want to stick with Star Strider, so I need to play the uh, Felgor matchup more. Uh, but it's now going to be interesting how boards are because beta decimal is a lot more different, which means more kill teams are playable on it. Uh, Votan, like a uh, halfkin, they they're still in a weird spot for me where I think like they're screaming for an eleventh operative, but if they do, that just makes them broken. So you can't do that. So they're it's like I think generally everything's reshuffled out apart from the S tier, and like if we were to, to do early tier lists. I would probably say Commandos and Felgor are still the best factions in the game if you played them competitively in a specific way, in, in such a way like you just play stall out. Because, uh, as I said, good Commando players were just using the Bomb Squig as an extra activation. They don't care because they were just like, cool, whatever. I have 11 activations, you have 10. I can outplay you that way. And Felgor can still just... If you don't have access to double shooting or double fighting they can just also outsource you on the points as well. Uh, pour one out for our Void Dancer homies all the way <laughs> at the bottom of... what? Well, like, if I was imagining, like, the normal play meta, they might be fine now, but all the way at the competitive meta, they're, oh, they're like, gone way now. at they're the bottom of the tier list right now. Yeah. Yeah, there's too like... much mental load and not there's just not enough going on. I think Warp Coven are the big trap. We're going to see, like, a bunch of Warp Coven players, and then after a month, they're all just going to drop off because they're like, this kill team's too hard to play. I will say that Warp Coven, I think, probably do have the competitive legs to at least make a pretty deep tournament run. In Spain last week, they did, I think they had an almost undefeated run. They were, like, competing for a 7-0 finish. Even though they wouldn't have won, they would have been, like, I think 5, or they would have been 6-0-1. So I think Warp Coven definitely have the legs to make it at this point, but they are not an easy team. Just like Higher Tech have the legs to make it, but they are not easy. Yeah, so like, there's like a layer say... on comp where you have to be very, very good on the team to even really approach a, a run that makes sense. But there are some teams that ha- this patch uh, remove that capability, and that is just Void Dancers. Yeah, I think like Warp Coven are in a good spot. They're probably like, they're in a four round fac- uh, four round tournament, they're very likely to go three, three, three and one. But I think it's it's going to be... You won't be able to do that consistently unless you put a lot of reps. Because the thing is, people go like, you still need to figure out how many Zangle you take per matchup and how many rubrics you take, because it's never going to be fixed. And then it's like, obviously, you're going to have to have a full roster for all your sorcerers. Yeah, what about you, Jason? Any uh, big, big broad thoughts? Maybe a, a tier list where we place in some of, uh, some of our teams on the tier list? Do you think Phobos... Are in a better spot post this data slate? Um, I mean, I think so because the the biggest, I think some of the biggest threats were just like Felgor, Commandos, and Vetguard, and them all being uh, knocked down a smidge. I mean, especially that that demo mine change is actually pretty huge, um, and like the mine layer's mine is still bigger than his. So you can actually screen out the demo mine just out standing out in the open with the with the haywire mine, which is a pretty huge change there. Um, yeah, I mean, Pathfinders, I think, if you were going to ask me, like, definitely near the top of the meta, <laughs> now that all of the Path- melee teams have been touched. I think Pathfinders, their problem is just, um, what do you call it, Felgor. So I'd put them at, like, high A. I think yeah. my top three factions would probably be uh, Felgor, Commandos, and Hyrotech. Yeah, I was about to say, like, I think higher tech might actually be, like, literal top of the meta right now. <laughs> yeah, they yeah. actually, like, totally slap, and reanimating on a two-up uh, and getting the, some, like, extra powers is... seems very yeah. strong. I do think that, like, they probably have probably too many stats now if they're rezzing on a two-up, is is what I expect. Yeah, I could see them getting nerfed. I think what also is going to happen is uh, higher tech players are going to be way too aggressive still with their nano mine and forgetting it doesn't do what it actually does and all of a sudden just get like shot off 
Because like interest in Hyrotech actually now really struggle into Pathfinders and Star Striders, but those teams don't do well into like Felgor. So it, yeah, we'll see how it goes. Kasserkin somehow at the bottom of the meta, you know, they've just been doing terribly week after week. Like I <laughs> think the team conceptually, I feel like the team is in a pretty good spot, but they have done miserably on the stats every week, week in, week out. They're just unplayable. So I don't no, really know what happened. The Kazakhin players are doing what the Phobos players did and just waiting for doing so bad that they finally get all these buffs that they don't know what to do with. Like, I feel bad for Phobos because now um, <laughs> they've lost the rule on uh, Vanguard, you know? It ha I think it had, what, like four or five different stacking effects? Now passing jump tests does nothing. So poor Phobos players, you know? <laughs> Yeah, they just want all nerd. those extra rolls. Yeah, it's just like my jump tests. I already passed them for free. It does nothing now. Well, a free mission action is still absolutely incredible. Oh, you for know, sure. It, yeah. it proves the point that any rule is good and any ability is good enough as long as you add like five different rules to it. Oh, man. All right. Yeah, I mean, broadly positive. We've got some, uh, definitely there will be some shifting in the meta over the last next couple weeks, you know. And uh, we've got our little handy dandy little uh, stats stats from the last week of uh, competitive play in our chat right here. So we could talk about that a little bit if we want to. Yeah. Mostly covering Adepticon, I think. Adepticon and its four pods take up a preponderance of the data this week. And Jason's out here with six incursors skewing the phobos win rate all the way up to 64 percent for the week no conceal orders because conceal orders are for cowards just i love it i love it um yeah uh that was definitely pretty exciting um i did three and one in the pod that i played in and then i went five and two in the overall the the two that knocked me out was leander's vet guard uh which was actually just absolutely insane um and um warp coven in the seventh round just teleporting a chain cannon around and double shooting into the dark is pretty bonkers um and we can see that i think it was uh single-handedly um where's warp coven on here because they had a big bump too didn't they in last week's win rates yeah warp coven last week here i'll post last week's too warp coven last week also did pretty well so it's like two consistent weeks of warp coven doing fairly well and one of them actually was this weekend at adepticon you know one of the guys he made it to top 10 i think yeah with warp coven yep and i think he had a mostly winning win rate too it was like uh five five and two four, yeah i think he was five like and that. two in the overall and then he also played in the pods and went three and one yeah, so I think Warp Coven definitely feel like they have some legs, especially, you know, with this data slate. I think they're probably going to get a big bump and a Warp Coven players who've been struggling, you know, maybe we'll have some tips on next week's podcast. You know, I honestly think Warp Coven with the bumps, uh, more people are going to swap over and try to play them. And then like, it's not easy and they're going to like tank the win rate and the people that are really good are going to do even better. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this weekend, Pathfinders slapped the crap out of everyone. They are 13, 13 tournaments and uh, four undefeated records, including uh, Ryan Slater, uh, Turning Point Tactics out there, just blowing up his friends and family out in Nottingham. No, that was in London. So that was oh, our nice. event. So we had five Pathfinder players. Four made it to the top eight <laughs> on three and one with one going undefeated because it was uh, Beta Decima only. So <laughs> I was just like... I was it was going to be a mixed event, and they were like, oh, we'll just do Beta Decima. We've got enough volunteers. What's the worst that could happen? I was like, okay, are you sure? And they're like, yeah. It's like, okay. So I busted out my Pathfinders, and let me say, fine team. Totally okay. That's okay. slap. So actually, with all of that experience with Pathfinders on Beta Decima and the, the visibility blocking, do you feel like that's really going to put a damper on them? Yeah, yeah, no, it messes them up, turning point one, especially as uh, now it affects from going from gantries uh, through the gantry footprint. Footprint, you basically can't mark a light, so you would be more aggressive. But the key thing is funny because I had uh, a Discord telling me off, telling me how to play Pathfinders from people who've never won tournaments. Um, but basically, the main strategy is like you you can't set up your marker lights, turning point one. So if you can't set up your marker lights, it's effectively over because uh, you have the issue is then. Because you have so limited numbers of high intensity marker lights now, you're in a situation where 
all your stuff who needs the marker lights activating first, and then you're just activating your marker lights last, which is not really efficient. And you can only get people, like while you stop people going up on the gantries, it's not a good way to win. So this has got me thinking, uh, with the way that Beta Decimal is going to work now, do you want to use Montca more often, just for the free mission actions and the double retain? Oh, you mean k on? Uh, no, I'd never use K-On. Montcar all the way. All the way. Montcar's just the someday, best. Someday they'll overbuff k Kalyon and I'll... Uh, use it. Look at 40k. They've spent four years... No, what, what, four editions trying to buff K-On? Just, just go Montcar. Montcar is the future. It's it's not the future. It's the way of life. I think, I think the problem is eventually... The, the real problem is that of the two mindsets in a competitive game where you can remove pieces from the game, if you go strong and remove stuff early, you just have more options later on in the game. And it's just very hard to overbuff waiting because there's just not enough defensive rules in the game especially when most people attack with more dice than you defend with yep like the, unless, the unless, it push, unless Kalyon automatically push you up to a four up save and you could go up to a three up in cover that would be i think that would be like a real buff too and then you might, would have a whole different way of playing but the way it is right now you just blow people up the only way you can make Kalyon interesting is if uh if someone shoots you while ready you can shoot back first but then you can't you can't shoot again later in the turning point so it's like a preemptive like Overwatch. That could be cool. But then I would take it, but currently when you give me a free dash, so like what I what I was doing was like recon drone switches to engage, dashes with Monk Car, shoots someone, analyzes, and then kills uh, kills someone else with my relentless fusion grenade. Amazing! I, I thank yeah, you for giving the, me that. That's the that's a standard Pathfinder cheese. Meanwhile, Slight. you know Gellerpox <laughs> this week also crushing it. You know Orion should have done Adepticon with the. Always, as always, nerfed Gellerpox casually, you know, seven, six, six ones. Amazingly, the short conversation I had with him when he when he first showed up, and I was like, oh, hey, how are you? Like, are you playing uh, Felgor? And he's like, no, the, when I play against people, they they don't have fun. And I, I would rather make friends than win games. Yeah. It's and partly he... like... He's, yeah, he's... go ahead, go ahead. No, no, because it, it, me and him had like this weird discussion where it's like, it's partly why I've stopped playing Pathfinder as well. Because it's just like, no one had fun against me on the weekend. Like they said, like, John, you're an amazing player, but I despise Pathfinders again. You made me remember the bad stuff. Because it's just like, yeah, I, I totally get away from I think Void Dancers are also one of those teams where it's like, nobody has fun <laughs> playing against them. So they just, people complain yeah. super loudly, which is why they went from, you know, an unplayable team to like an extremely <laughs> unplayable team for tournament <laughs> play. <laughs> Yeah, but it's, it's just like, it, uh, it, it, I get where he's coming from. He's such a lovely guy. And the problem is, uh, like, you feel bad when you're playing a team and your opponent physically isn't enjoying the game, not because of you, but because your kill team is just so toxic to play against. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Gellerpox, you know, still out here. They actually pulled pretty good numbers. There were two other tournaments where they went three and zero. So some, it looks like maybe some other people are kind of learning the ways of Gellerpox, you know, staying fully... Fully, fully safe as long as possible, making sure you barge through doors, slap people. Uh, you know, Void Dancers out here with their 61% win rate for the weekend, making sure that this nerf is well deserved. The backhand, <laughs> backhand came in hard and fast. <sighs> Felt poor, as always. I think this is an interesting week because it was basically like a very divergent week. A lot of these weeks we've had a couple people floating around 45%, 55%. And then this week it was like you're either 60% or you're under 40. Well, it's like the it, it's why I stopped doing weekly stat reviews because the problem is kill team is even though like well, I think we're averaging nearly 4,000 games a month now, which is good. The problem is we're unfortunately still not big enough because you get really weird swings. I remember covering it one month where <laughs> novitiates were like one week, 60, 65, 70. And I was like, this is it. And then for some reason, mysteriously, they went down to like 30, which brought down the entire average. And I was just like, you, you psychic monsters stopping yourself getting nerfed. Ridiculous. <laughs> I think, it, to be fair, we do this just because it's kind of like a fun way to kind of look at what oh, no, is good. Because good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like, I think this this has helped us catch the higher attack and the warp coven stuff that you know was on the way. Because things that do well on a week, we go and look and you're like, oh, maybe there are some legs for these teams. Because we went uh, when warp coven did well, we checked the region. It was in Spain. They did well in a tournament with Ace and Hava and all these other people. Was it Nazareth? Same thing for uh, same. No, it wasn't actually. It was uh, Manek. Oh. We were trying to get him on for you know next week's podcast, but he's uh, been hard to get. So we're grabbing Depticon for next week instead. And then higher tech also, you know, we saw them doing well in Russia at one of their big GTs a couple weeks ago. 
did a little bit of sniffing around, pulled in Shane because for some reason we've had Shane on our podcast like three times and every single time we talk about Higher Tech Circle. Yeah, and then including last week, he jumped on for a couple of minutes, so that's uh, the fourth episode he was on already by now. <laughs> I think we literally talk about Higher Tech every time. Yeah. So Higher Tech is just one of those teams that we've seen do well that I think has, was surprising. Um, we've seen Farstalkers kind of do miserably week to week, so it's no surprise they're getting changed. And Blades Wait, of Cain... Star Striders? Uh, no, Star Striders have been hitting like very low play rates, actually. Though there's Star Striders here. Uh, oh yeah, you can see they're like way down in the bottom bottom 26. of the pile. 26%. They've got a thirty seven percent win rate. They're like well under the forty. Really? Oh, yeah. uh, I'm looking at the this week. Yeah, last week they were under forty. This week they're oh, gosh. they're like. So yeah, you know, Star Striders. They've they did okay in a couple tournaments, and in a bunch of other tournaments, they got slapped. Right. I think from, as a like person who was effectively main in Star Striders at this point, it's just due to Felgor. Like it's it's such a bad matchup and Commandos. Actually, two, um, like... so Star Striders were at an invitation in Argentina with I think I don't know if there's anyone we know down there, but there's a twelve man invitational, and there's two Star Striders players, and they are all the way down at the bottom, and Pathfinders and Hand of the Archon at the top. <laughs> Pathfinder is actually a really hard matchup for Star Strider as well, and I, oh, I yeah, know as sure, Pathfinder is sure. getting more popular, so it's like it depends if it's a, like it's just weird. I think if you nerf, like if they properly nerf Felgor and Commandos, then my top factions would probably have been Star Striders, Higher Attack, and Wormblade. Yeah, I think Wormblade are definitely up there, but also one of those teams that's hard enough to play where I kind of suspect their win rate is never going to be going to be oh. consistently wildly over the top yeah it's like they're, they're starting to do better and better because yeah from what i was like they were like borderline 57 like 56 percent like they're just hitting like i think last month they were 57 overall with a decent last week they were 45 percent. this week they were they were at 55 this week so but part of that is being carried by john like i think in the rest of the u.s maybe I think there's one other consistently oh, we have lots well of good one play players. players here in the uk as well it, it, it's like they i think the problem is they are still a very gotcha faction but they have so many tools now even though you know how they work they have a lot of ways around that still so it's quite hard to deal with uh but you know we, we only have to last so long for Wormblade players before they get replaced by brood brothers so you know and it's the fun. Patriarch comes and assumes control over the team. Well, I, I, I'm, I, I'm waiting for that kill team to just be broken from the gate. I was like, I don't care. I'm, I'm using them. I don't care. You've given me a big gene stealer that can activate twice. I'm sure they're going to be balanced. I'm sure. Meanwhile, it's be fun. meanwhile, this, meanwhile, this, uh, this week, elite players outside of Phobos on Suicide Watch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just well, Phobos is the best elite team at the moment. The secret, so. the secret is, guys, six incursors all engage. And just stand in the security that and every game. Yes, that's what yeah, he did. For, he didn't what? bring any other models. Yeah, so he brought I, six <laughs> Yeah, zero sideboard. Um, I think across 11 games, I had one guy on conceal for one turn in like four of them. And otherwise, the strategic, it's just like the alpha strike. The strategic choice, John, is that the way you beat four attacks on threes, three, four, no cover in accuracy is you shoot three times a turn per model. <laughs> Because he turns on Bolter Discipline on turn one. He walks up on Vanguard to the halfway uh, point and just blows people up. Because, like, yeah, you could either be fully on Conceal, which is probably what you should be. But if you're ever... like, And the other thing, part of this plays into how GW uh, tournaments only have one set of Octarius per board. So because of the way that Heavy is laid out on Octarius, just because Octarius doesn't have enough non-Vantage Heavy pieces, you end up getting spots where they have to use Obscurity to protect your drop zone. And in that situation, six incursors with triple shooting effectively, because you're always going to be able to overwatch against the wider teams. So triple shooting bolters means that eventually you will pile in enough dice where someone dies, especially yeah. when you have no cover and they have to roll all their defense naturally. Yes. So the five up save teams do suffer quite a bit. Yeah. So it's like the, if you can, if you, if you dash one of your Phobos screens, which you don't have to telegraph if you use elite reconnaissance, um, and then you move dash an extra 10 and jump over something. You're 13 inches and there's a, there's like enough terrain to to f actually have like five bottles in heavy cover on conceal. And that's it. So if you brought 10 models, you've got five of them just flapped in the wind. 
Um, and then basically you can just like run out there and be like, oh, is this your plasma gun and engage? It dies. Uh, and then if they if they like don't die and they try to like get an angle back, like I will happily trade a warrior for like a victory point and killing your plasma gun. And then after that, you set up Overwatch on uh, ideally at least five objectives, if not six. And then like you kill the only threats they have. And then they're like, I can't interact with you. I can't charge. I can't fight. If I I can like move on to this objective, but I'm going to get overwatched. And then they just like stand there taking just mega shots per round. And uh, about turn two, you should also aim to secure or loot all six points, which I've done a surprisingly large amount of times with Vanguard. You can just like run in, double tap people, steal their points, give someone a zero point turn two, and then just run off with it. You can get tabled after that. It's totally fine. It definitely does work. Like I, we've we've done a couple scrims, and I was like, yeah, this is this is this is really annoying, actually. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. gross. <laughs> And it's uh, it's it's purely and specifically on pure Octarius where you have to use obscurity to cover some drop zones. That's where this works. Like if you can have a drop zone where you can fully play a couple models that are like there's more than one position where you can be fully out of line of sight or out of visibility, then there's just like no real way to have a response for the the Phobos Marines because they're on obscurity and you're not. Did you not win best most sporting player? Like almost the mag player, like was that a prize? I don't there was uh, there was nothing like that, so it was pretty much just like oh. the top three and like best painted, and yeah, uh, it was uh, it, it yeah, but um, it was super fun. World. I like I've been meaning to to show off the all in cursors, all engage, and I finally did it, which feels really good. And I'm really, I mean, five two isn't like the most amazing thing in the world, but for not using conceal orders, it's insane. Um, some of those games were very, very scary. You're just like standing out in the open. And it's like, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna die. <laughs> oh my gosh, this this is the most monster. fearful way to play. <laughs> He's a monster. Oh, oh man. man. Yeah, because you see, I see, I I read, I read the comment. You said like I lost three incursors to like a commando. Dynamite, and then he still won. Yep. I was just like, "What?" <laughs> yeah, I was like eating, and he was like kind of a newer player, um, because like he put, um, he put the dynamite on a regular boy, and like we talked about it. He had a token on it, um, and then I was just like non reciprocal, like annihilating him, and then I like open a door, and then I kill like three of the commandos in there, and there's just one boy left. And I'm like, that should be fine. And then he's like, the boy switches to engage, and I was like, uh, that's a weird choice. He's like, the boy throws the dynamite. And I was like, oh. <laughs> He's the boy with the dynamite. Um, but yeah, it was too late by then. Like he was the alpha strike had gone off. Yeah, that's what Jason's here for. All right. Well, John, thanks for swinging by, catching up on the data slate and uh, talking about the stats a little bit week to week. I know you like doing your longer stat shows, so people can find those over at uh, your channel. CandyRollerCrit.com and do that. <laughs> Because we're all and on Goonhammer. Hammer. Yeah, because both of us are on Goonhammer. All of us are on Goonhammer. That's right. We show up on Goonhammer from time to time. Maybe right. maybe I'll, I'll start being the dominant with uh, Star Riders and <laughs> get them nerfed in the next balance day of slate. Pull the ladder up behind you. <laughs> no more ships for everyone. It's only me. And remember, friends, you can always kill a frenzied goat if you can roll a crit. Ooh. <sighs> I'll send you another crit. Birth the note, right?